Great. Well, hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us this morning. Um, I'm Brian Wallace. I'll be moderating this session. I work at the University of Colorado Denver, and I'm a student currently pursuing my MPH, uh, and I'm part of the Career Development Committee for SMDM. Uh, so I'm excited to moderate this session. It should be really interesting. And just for some logistics, we're going to have two presenters today, uh, one at a time, and we'll have a couple clarifying questions at the end of the first session. Uh, but please hold most of your questions till the general Q&A at the end. Um, and you can raise your hand to ask a question. So uh, we'll go ahead, get, go ahead and get started. I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Joanna Siegel. She directs the dissemination and implementation program at the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, PCORI. Uh, the DNI program is the home of PCORI's funding initiatives and other activities to another. promote the awareness and uptake of evidence from PCORI-funded research and practice. The program also handles the public release of PCORI's comparative effectiveness research findings in lay languages and lay language formats tailored for public as well as professional versions. Joanna received her doctorate in the Health Decision Sciences from the Harvard School of Public Health. On faculty there, her research focused on cost-effectiveness analysis and its application in HIV and AIDS policy, diabetes, and drug policy. She worked with the U.S. Public Health Service Panel to propose standards for cost-effectiveness studies and co-edited its report, The Cost-Effectiveness in Health and Medicine as well as the recent update to that report, which continues to be an important reference for the field. She later joined the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, AHRQ, heading the Decision Sciences and Patient Engagement Division in AHRQ's Center for Evidence and Practice Improvement, with a focus on communicating evidence and engaging patients in healthcare decisions. So thanks for speaking with us today, Joanna. Thank you, Brian. Um, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. All good? Okay, well, thank you for the invitation. I'm um, very happy to talk with you all about funding opportunities at PCORI. Um, I think I probably also can speak for Karen, uh, the next speaker, in saying that, you know, we, we really appreciate uh, the effort it takes to become a um, really well-versed at uh, submitting applications for funding. Uh, you can you can see it from our perspective when people have experience in this and you know we look forward to your questions. The first slide. Um, I'd like to start with just a little bit about uh, PCORI. We are uh, an independent research institute but authorized by Congress in uh, 2010, um, just recently reauthorized. Uh, we are run by a Board of Governors, that's uh, broadly reflective of stakeholder communities. And we fund comparative clinical effectiveness research or CER, um, basically to, with a focus of answering questions about uh, real world problems and what, what works best for patients in those real world settings. Next slide. Um, a few things that you will hear us talk about frequently. First of all, of course, is um, the emphasis on comparative effectiveness research. And this is research that compares the benefits and harms of at least two different approaches for preventing, diagnosing, treating, or monitoring a clinical condition. Um, and, that, and that, again, looks to real world populations. We highlight patient centeredness in our work. Um, that is to say that our research is intended to inform real decision dilemmas that are relevant to patients and reflect also the outcomes that are important to patients and caregivers. Um, we also talk a lot about patient and stakeholder engagement. Um, we think it's very important that patients be real partners in research. Um, next slide. This is a snapshot of where we are uh, at the moment. Uh, after 10 years, we've awarded almost $3 billion worth of funding uh, almost seven, uh, 1,700 uh, different awards. Um, we uh, study a full range of health conditions. As you can see here, uh, behavioral health is the top uh, most frequent uh, focus of study, but followed by many others. Um, and we do have uh, strong areas of focus in uh, disparities and um, you know, 
populations that have not traditionally been the focus of, you know, kind of your standard clinical trials. Um, this is a, a screenshot of where you can go on our website to basically explore our, por our portfolio of what we've funded. What we funded. You can take a look. Um, you can use keywords to search. You can look by condition or population. And um, if you're interested in applying to PCORI for funding, I do suggest that this is a good place to start and just kind of looking at the type of thing that we fund. Um, uh, so um, Tara reminded me when preparing this talk that our recent reauthorization is actually very relevant um, to the SMDM audience. Um, next slide. When we were uh, reauthorized in um, last December, um, basically we received funding or we were, our funding was authorized for the next 10 years at about the same level that it has been. But there were um, two new research priorities added, maternal, maturity, I'm sorry, maternal mortality and um, IDD. Um, but also we are now able to include economic impacts in our um, in our studies, which we were not able to do before. Um, we still cannot do cost effectiveness analysis. We have an explicit prohibition from doing anything related to qualities. So that part hasn't changed, but now we are charged with looking at economic impacts in order to get a fuller view of um, the burdens of treatments and of, of healthcare conditions. Um, next slide. We just recently put out uh, the following principles, which uh, describe how we are interpreting uh, this mandate. Um, we have a long way to go in terms of developing specific guidance for awardees, which will be you know, much more to the point. Um, but these are out for public comment. And I do invite you to go to our website and take a look at uh, the, there's a, a principles document that elaborates a lot more on where we're going with this and submit your comments if you'd like to. So now I will turn to uh, an overview of our funding opportunities. Next slide. Um, next slide. Uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, the research funding opportunities that we have. Um, the first one in kind of our broad and methods areas. Uh, the second is our targeted initiative. And third is our placer awards, new awards. And finally, I will talk about our implementation awards uh, in addition to those research um, opportunities. Next slide. So this is a slide um, that shows the, uh, our national priorities for research, um, as well as methods. So we fund in all of these areas. I'm pulling out uh, our CDR, Communication and Dissemin Dissemination Research Priority, particularly, which I think um, may be of interest to some of you. Um, it is, of course, comparative effectiveness research. But in this particular priority area, um, we're looking at, for example, different risk communication approaches or communication strategies. Um, these are uh, what we call our broad funding announcements. So those are offered regularly with the next uh, letters of intent due in February of 2021. Next slide. Um, this is three examples of studies, uh, research studies that have been funded through either our broads, the CDR specifically among the broads and the methods um, areas. Uh, the first one is, um, hi I'm highlighting uh, one that was on shared decisions for patients with chest pain. Um, this one was uh, for patients experience, experiencing chest, main, chest pain who went into the ER, um, who basically uh, were helped to make decisions around whether they wanted to stay for observation or go home. Uh, we have one here on improving diabetes. This was a, um, a method study um, that looked at a number of existing clinical trials and reanalyzed them looking at heterogeneity of treatment effect. And finally, one that looked at a family-centered uh, approach to communication on medical rounds to um, prevent medical errors. 
just three um, kind of random examples that I, um, just to make this a little bit more concrete. Um, next slide, please. Our targeted funding initiatives come out on specific high impact topics. So basically, PCORI has a process of um, working with stakeholders to generate, to, to find out what is of strong interest and to develop topics um, that are then put out as uh, targeted funding initiatives. The most recent one was on suicide prevention for youth. Um, this one had awards up to $10 million in total direct costs. Um, in terms of the targeted initiatives, the best way to keep track of those is to look regularly at our website for upcoming announcements. Um, third, um, we have, uh, next slide please, the Placer Awards. These are new. Um, this is uh, the first uh, round of these. They are large uh, individual le level or cluster, cluster RCTs um, that require funds in excess of $10 million. Um, they are to address important decisional dilemmas. Um, they can look at clinical or delivery system interventions, and they have a two stage structure, which is why they're called um, a phased studies. There, there's a feasibility phase and then followed by a full scale study. Again, the letters of intent for this first round on these is, have come in and applications for those are due in January. Um, so now I'd like to, um, to talk with you about, about um, implementation awards, which is something different. These are not research awards. Um, the the uh, dissemination and implementation program at PCORI is charged with basically heightening the awareness of our research and with getting the findings into practice. Um, we do three broad areas of activities. One is the release of findings, which is to say we put, tar uh, we put um, a translated abstracts for patients and for professionals up on our website for all of our studies. Um, and the lay language ones are between a sixth and eighth grade reading level. We do dissemination, uh, working with stakeholder organizations to increase awareness of findings. And we do implementation to promote actual uptake of evidence in practice settings. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so the, these implementation funding opportunities are what I wanna highlight here. Um, these are again designed to actually get evidence used. Uh, we have three different funding announcements. One is focused on uptake of shared decision-making approaches. So not the development of decision aids, but the, uh, the actual use of them in practice. Um, these are uh, awards of about 1.5 million in total costs. The next letters of intent will be due in June. We also do uh, the implementation of findings from some of PCORI's major research in investments. We uh, identify a couple of topics that we wanna prioritize and take, up, take applications on those. Um, that is, that there is a, um, a cycle of those currently in, project, in process. So um, you will have to check the website on the next ava availability of these. Um, and finally, the limited competition uh, which is uh, which gives our investigator teams, those who've completed research, essentially the opportunity to take those findings the next step um, into uh, uptake in regular health system settings. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about the shared decision making um, opportunity. Next slide, please. Uh, for a couple reasons. One is because I think there are many people who might be interested in this. Um, the other thing is that it's an open competition as opposed to the limited competition. So the limited competition, the third one that I mentioned there, does require that either you are or you have a, a co-PI who was a PCORI uh, funded awardee. Um, the shared decision-making uh, initiative does not have that requirement. Um, you can be a PCORI awardee who has found an effective approach to shared decision-making as demonstrated in a comparative effectiveness research study, or you can take evidence that's been developed through any uh, PCORI funded research and incorporate it into an existing testing, tested shared decision-making strategy and then implement it. 
So um, we, we do look for these awards to have similar uh, potential for really building sustainable projects in that they use multi multi-component implementation strategies that address what are real barriers to shared decision-making uptake and practice that demonstrate the commitment of frontline staff uh, and others at sites to um, really help get something into place and also that, that have a thorough uh, program evaluation, project evaluation in terms of the fidelity of the original approach. Um, one quick example of these, um, next slide please. We have a, one, a study that we're, well, this, a study that was done at PCORI that applied for an implementation award. And this one, the original study compared the effectiveness of a decision aid for patients with advanced heart failure who are looking at the possibility of getting a left ventricular assist device, um, which as you may know, has quite an impact on quality of life. It's an important decision. Uh, patients had significantly improved knowledge and higher concordance between values and treatment choice. For their implementation project, they're taking this effective approach and expanding the use to 100 LVAT clinics in the US, uh, beginning with 15 early adopter sites and then expanding to reach quite a, a broad population of patients. Um, they will, in that project, evaluate the consistency of decision aid use in the implementation setting um, and also continue to evaluate decision quality to make sure that when it's implemented, it continues to be effective as it was in the research. And that's kind of what these look like. Um, let me move to some specific information for applicants. Next slide, please. Um, our funding opportunities are described on our website. Um, there's an, you can find funding opportunities listed here. This is what it looks like. Um, and you can go directly to open opportunities to find ones that are taking applications. Next slide. Who can apply? Well, uh, we do take applications from uh, a broad range of organizations. Of course, most are academic organizations. Um, and there is some ability for uh, non-US uh, applications as well. Next slide. Our uh, review process for, uh, this is applies to our implementation awards as well as our research awards is that you submit a letter of intent um, and then if invited, you submit a full application. Those applications receive a preliminary um, online review and then a full in-person panel review. And finally, they're approved through a PCORI selection committee for recommendation to the board for approval. A couple of tips for, um, for applicants. Next slide, please. Uh, first of all, do read the uh, funding announcement very carefully. Um, the, the program staff put a lot of effort into communicating the motivation uh, for a specific, um, uh, for, for making awards in a specific area, as well as um, the very specific um, goals and constraints around each PFA. They're, each one is unique, so it is important to read the one that you, that you are planning to apply to. Look particularly at the description of the research of interest um, and pay attention to the merit review criteria, including um, the ones that address patient-centeredness and stakeholder um, engagement. One of the really easy things to do to do well in an award is to respond explicitly to what is asked in the PFA. Use the Help Center. There are FAQs, and if you can't find what you're looking for, you can submit a question or use contact emails that are in the, the PFAs. Um, and we do welcome, you know, contact, questions, clarification, so that you can submit the best possible letters of intent and the best possible applications that are most promising for funding. Um, when you submit an, a letter of intent or an application, do pay attention to administrative details, like page limits. What you don't want to do is come in a page long and essentially have your last page deleted before it's forwarded to merit review. Um, these these um, administrative requirements are for the purpose of fairness. And for that reason, um, they're taken very seriously. Um, 
again, start early. Um, speak with a program officer if you're thinking about applying so that you can really understand the, the, uh, the boundaries of the, uh, of the PFA as well as you know, really what the intent is. And again, look at those specific requirements. Um, they have very program specific guidance. Um, next slide, please. One other thought is if you want to uh, learn more about the merit review process or what is usually called peer review process in, um, in you know, NIH and elsewhere, um, we call it merit review, but you can become a merit reviewer. And, um, you know, it is a certain amount of work, of course, but you do learn a lot about how this review process runs and it can, can stand you in good stead for your, your future career. Next slide. Um, as Brian said, happy to take a few questions uh, or I'll uh, turn it back to you. Yeah, so we have time for about one to two clarifying questions, and then we'll move on to our next presenter and have a large Q&A session at the end. So if you have a question, please raise your hand using the Zoom function. I have a question. Um, Joanna, can you talk a little bit about the timeline in getting a PCORI award? So from time of letter of submit to possible getting money in the bank. Sure. And also, <laughs> because I noticed that the LVAD study that you highlighted is actually um, Brian and I, our team study. Congratulations on that one. Yeah, so, we're very yeah. proud of that LVAD study. Yes, so are we, so are we. Um, so uh, the timeline does vary um, across, uh, you know, funding announcements uh, based on the time of year as well. You know, when you're trying to avoid holidays and that sort of thing, that can definitely have an impact on the timeline. But essentially, uh, you're looking at a, uh, a the full process in eight to 10 months um, from the letter of intent submission, allowing time for review, we respond to letters of intent with you know, specific points, uh, then a period of time to allow you to prepare your application, um, then the time for merit review. After merit review, uh, we also have time for what's called a per process, per query information request, where if merit review has raised some major issues uh, that, that may be just a question of clarification that the program will get back to the applicant and, and ask those questions. Um, and then, of course, um, there's the uh, time allowed for the funding decisions and the approval process to go through PCORI. So all in all, we try, um, we try hard to get it down to the eight months to when the contract is then, you know, it can be issued. Uh, but sometimes based on the time of year, usually it may take a couple months longer than that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Siegel. I think we'll move on to the next presenter in the interest of time. So we will have more time for questions at the end, but uh, next, working with the NIH, is Dr. Karen Lee. Uh, Dr. Lee is the program director for NICHD's Behavioral Pediatrics and Health Promotion Extramural Research Program. Prior to joining the NIH, Dr. Lee worked with the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force and Evidence-Based Practice Centers programs at the agency for healthcare research and quality. These activities came after several years of working on medical product safety at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and the Health Resources and Services Administration. A graduate, graduate of Northwestern University's Honors Programs in Medical Education, Dr. Lee completed pediatrics internships and residency training at New York Presbyterian Hospital in New York City, followed by pediatric research fellowships and Master of Public Health at Harvard University. So thank you, Dr. Lee, for presenting. Okay. Um, thanks for having me. And um, yeah, and so I guess I, um, you know, my talk is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, somewhat different in orientation from um, Joanna's, um, which was which was terrific. Um, I'm sort of picking up where you know where um, she kind of left off, and in, in, um, and I'll be focusing more on um, you know some 
some suggestions from a program officer's perspective on working with, you know, working with a funding agency and working with program officers, um, which, you know, um, would, uh, you know, would apply to NIH and, you know, and could um, uh, generalize um, to some extent to other funding agencies. Next slide. Um, yeah, so, so as I mentioned, I'll be focusing on working with program officers. This is an introductory talk, but it's not um, NIH 101. Um, and I'll be focusing on some common PI, PO interaction points throughout the NIH application and grant life cycle, as well as some suggestions on how to optimize the relationship. And I'll be glossing over several important topics just to manage expectations. Okay, so. Um, so at NIH, um, who, you know, what is a program officer? Um, we, as far, as far as the actual mineral research community is concerned, um, we, you know, we manage the scientific research portfolio and, you know, oversee, you know, areas of science um, and, and um, work on, you know, within NIH have other responsibilities. But I guess for, you know, for the, for the PI, um, you know, we're your point, your, your, usually your primary point of contact with the agency. Um, at NIH, um, a program officer is almost always at the doctoral level. Um, other synonyms um, at NIH um, can include program director, health science administrator, medical officer. I mean, these are, um, you know, at NIH, you know, for actually more research portfolio, usually um, more or less the same thing. Um, and, you know, you know, I'll just leave it at that. Um, also, um, at NIH, um, for, for review, um, that is run by a separate um, division or branch um, and managed by the scientific review officer. And then your grants manager officer or specialist you know, holds the first string. Next slide. So the roles of an NIH program officer um, formally are scientist, administrator, communicator, and steward. Um, our, you know, um, I guess I look at this as, you know, the administrator of his role is the floor, not the ceiling. Um, so I think in a positive relationship, you know, that's, you know, the, the relationship is more than that. Um, you know, the program officer, um, you know, we also provide guidance. And so we're, you know, to, to some extent, you know, can serve as a mentor and, you know, and, you know, provide words of encouragement, you know, just because this process can be long and, and arduous. Um, and, you know, and to some extent, you know, your program officer can be like, you know, your real estate agent in promoting, in promoting your work, um, you know, in other, you know, in other discussions or, um, you know, or, you know, or, um, you know, um, trying to improve your publicity. Um, next slide. So the overall life cycle of a grant, um, you know, you have this terrific idea um, to form a research team. Um, and you know, um, go, go through um, go through your institution and you know and contact, and I guess contact NIH well before well before you're thinking, ideally well before you're thinking of submitting, um, and, and not you know, not two weeks before. Um, and the, um, at NIH, you know, depending on the announcement that you're applying to, um, you know, the applications can go through. Um, you know, a centralized NIH Center for Scientific Review, um, or can go to a specific um, study section that's run by the, the institute to which you're applying. Um, you know, and you know, uh, um, peer review. Um, you know, uh, uh, will you know, re review your your application, um, and you know, and then based on you know on on, on your scores. Um, I should, based on your based on your scores, you know, then you know your institute or PO will take next steps. I mean, I guess with this slide, I mean, we you know we and I just should, should say we would like to evaluate the program relevance more upfront as well. But you know, but I guess that you know some institutes also reevaluate program relevance and priorities at this stage as well. Um, you know, and I guess this, this would be in, combined with you know, and, and I think that sort of um, permeates the last few. Um, steps here, where then um, the your application is reviewed by the um, advisory council of the institute to which you're applying, and then finally by the institute director um, before um, before we make a funding commitment. Next slide. So I outlined some points, um, some suggestions as to when to contact your PO. 
Um, as I mentioned, you know, before submission, please contact us early. Um, you know, um, when you're able to assemble a one-page specific aim, um, because that helps us, you know, um, guide, you know, um, either accept or refer you, and you want to ensure that you have a home um, and a, and a you know a solid acceptance before you actually submit. Um, and so, um, you know, so, so of course this will precede um, peer review, um, and then um, contest contact us again after you receive your summary statement. We cannot talk to you about your review before you receive your summary statement. Um, and, you know, and then um, um, you can reach out again um, if, you, if you need to resubmit. Um, we'll be in touch and you know, if your application continues to move forward, we'll be in touch um, you know, um, as it goes through council and you'll he hear, from, um, you'll hear from, us, from us again. Um, if you know if an award you know if it's moving toward an award through um, what's called um, just in time, where you know the grants management specialist will request um, you know I guess you know la you know just you know um, updated information you know about things like your other support et cetera um, um, before the award is actually issued. And if you're um, putting together a clinical trial, then um, we, there is increased attention to um, clinical trial oversight at NIH. Such that you know your um, milestones um, for um, you know for uh, recruitment enrollment and you know analysis and trial completion need to be um, established um, prior to award. Um, you know, of course, um, the notice of award is is a is a is a terrific time, and um, but you should also um, be in touch with your PO after the award. And then that's just sort of a broad stroke in broad strokes where I'm going. Next slide. Okay, so in terms of finding a home at NIH, um, I would suggest being proactive. Um, and you know, to some extent, to some extent, you do have agency here that um, you know that that I would suggest trying to exercise. Um, you know, um, you know, so I, so I, I think you know, applications, you know, fr from our perspective, finding a home for your application depends, you know, of course, on on what you're doing. You know um, what are your outcomes, your your um, you know your your population um, and topic, and you know. But when when um, there are um, what when your when your when your proposal is a potential interest to multiple institutes, um, I would suggest you know shop, you know at this at this time it's okay to shop and find the best home and to go where you sense the most support. Um, and so you know you know if we'll, if, you know, so from a P, from a P, from a PI perspective, you know that might or may that might or might not be the first the first PO um, who accepts your application. Um, you know, unfortunately, many PIs never contact us before submission, um, or you know, or just go with the first acceptance. Um, and this is a good time, you know, to sort of meet your prospective POs, understand you know what it, what it might be like to work with him or her, um, and to establish a relationship because you want your PO to know who you are in a good way. Um, so again, this is a, this this period is about maintaining your agency. Try to be intentional and selective. If you can help it, try not to email multiple POs at the same institute at the same time because we'll often figure it out and then decide for you. Um, and there and, and many institutes have you know a, a referral email address um, that you can write to you know if you're not sure where your application um, should go. But I um, but we do have you know you can look. I think on the next slide. Okay, it's not there yet, but, but I, I guess um, I'll, I'll get to it. But basically, um, you know, another, uh, but otherwise, I'm saying it, um, to reach out to prospective ICs and POs because there's variable support. I mean, we, we the different institutes at NIH, when there is scientific overlap, have different lenses through which we look at areas of science. And there can be variable support across and within ICs and POs um, that, you know, you can try to, um, Gauge during this, this process, you know, and so regarding scientific overlap, you know, you know, examples for NICHD would would be that we tend to have you know more of a de developmental, um, generally disease agnostic focus, whereas you know many of the ICs at NIH are focused on um, dis specific diseases and organ systems. Um, this is you know your opportunity to under try to understand differences um, in perspective and priorities among the different institutes, which can be kind of subtle. 
and to try to gauge where your science and career would be most likely to advance. Um, next slide. Okay, so um, so in deciding where to go, um, you know, aside from looking you know broadly at the different institutes and, and seeing you know where your where you think your application might fit. Um, you can query MIH Reporter's matchmaker tool that will refer you, you know, where, where you can see for your topic or area of science, you know, um, what, you know, what, um, you know, what institutes and, and um, program officers have been active in that area. Um, you want to gauge alignment with the institute priorities, and this is uh, something that I would suggest looking at, at um, from a multi-level perspective. So, um, you know, so within NIH, you know, you look at different, you can look at the different institutes, um, the, the, you know, and within institutes, the branches and divisions to see, you know, what their organizational priorities are, and then, you know, at the portfolio level, you know, look at how the portfolio description is written and, you know, low and high program priorities to get a sense of um, where your research might fit. Um, just, I would also recommend looking at the institute strategic plans, organizational charts, mission statements, and again, the high and low program priorities. Um, and you know, I, I think we we do rec we do realize that you know um, these um, you know that not all areas of science are explicitly called out, but I think that it's helpful when you do see yourself reflected somewhere in you know um, you know on the website. Um, look at specific funding opportunity announcements. Um, you know, and um, for an institute to participate um, in a funding opportunity announcement, at minimum, you know. A program, a program officer you know, need, needed to, you know, want to take it forward and make a pay, the case for it, and um, the institute leadership needed to concur. Um, it's important to note, though, that non-participation by an institute does not necessarily mean there's lack of interest at the institute, because there can be administrative reasons for non-participation. Um, also go with, you know, obviously consult your mentors and peers um, for their um, recommendations and um, experience. And we advise all applicants to work closely with your Office of Sponsored Programs um, at your institution to guide you through this process from your institution's perspective. Next slide. So in reaching out to uh, your prospective PO, um, it's best to send an, just a, you know, send an introductory email um, introducing yourself, your interests, and what you'd like to achieve. Um, it's, you know, please send a one pager um, that includes your background, specific aims, hypotheses, and outcomes. Otherwise, you know, I will often ask you for one. Um, and you could request a brief phone conversation, which you know, the PO might or might, might not deem necessary. Next slide. No, but I guess I would you know, recommend trying to establish a relationship because your PO is much more likely to advocate for you if, if we know you. Um, and again, I would, but I, but I think it's you, you help us um, help you um, by, um, you know, figuring out what what you're able to figure out in the, you know, in the public domain and or working with your institution first. Um, and you know, so e email is often preferred over phone calls, and I recommend just because it can, you know. Um, um, people can get busy. Not, Non-responsiveness can be, you know, can be a you know, common problem. Um, to be assertive and follow up as needed. Um, and after multiple, you know, if, if you don't receive a response after multiple emails, try calling or going to a colleague um, in the, you know, in, in your PO's group um, to see if you can find someone, you know, to help you. Or will often, you know, try to nudge the person you're trying to contact. Um, ask about the communication preferences and how your PO works with grantees. Um, this you know can help you understand our bandwidth, our baseline level engagement, and potential opportunities for your area of science. Um, and it can also be helpful to send short summary emails and action items after calls, um, just so that you have things on record. Next slide. Um, so you know some things to, you know to to ask during the initial phone call. You know would include um, alignment with priorities. And again, I would suggest um, a multi-level approach, um, but then also understand that, you know, not all topics are represented. And so, you know, um, that doesn't necessarily mean support for, that, that doesn't necessarily mean lack of support for a topic at an institute, but it's, but it, I think it's also 
um, really important to learn at this stage if there is not, if your PO is going to tell you that, you know, it's not aligned with priorities, then you should, you need to find another home. Um, you know, I, I try to make this, you know, the PI's call and, you know, allow, you know, allow the PI to ask whatever they want. Um, you can ask for PO feedback on your one, on your one pager. I mean, we do have to maintain, um, you know, a, a, a fair, equitable arm's length distance. Um, and we're not one of your co-investigators, but, you know, we can provide some feedback. Um, but you know, obviously we're not reviewing your application. Um, um, something to think about early on that, you know, um, can throw new investigators off at the end is that, you know, if you do cross the finish line um, and are selected for funding, you know, many, you know some institutes um, will um, implement an, an administrative budget reduction across the board on all funded awards. So, um, you know, it's helpful to think upfront about what you really need. Um, to complete your project versus what would be nice to have because you, you know, there, there is a possibility that you could be asked to shave, you know, 15% off at the end. Um, and, you know, you can also ask for, um, you know, referrals and suggested next steps. Um, and I'm jumping ahead, but your, um, your PO, you know, can, you know, be a fly on the wall and listen to your study section um, and you know, can ask, you know, when and how they'd like to be reminded. Um, to do that. Next. Um, many, many PIs will ask for study section recommendations. Um, I view this as a very important decision and one that should be made by the PI. So I refer you, I'll generally refer you to, um, you know, the, um, you know, another NIH tool, again, this is for centralized review um, from the NIH Center for Scientific Review, um, where you can input your, you know, um, whatever you, you know, your, your title, abstract, specific aims, whatever you want to, you know, what you want to search for on your project and come back with, you know, um, you know, strong and possible matches. Um, the CSR recently did reorganize their study sections and, um, and, and also has more guidance about how the study sections differ from each other. Um, but I would suggest that you know, so, so you can look at that, you know, look at that sort of high level information, but I always advise um, PIs to look specifically at the study section roster um, and think about each prospective person being a potential um, reviewer um, and possible advocate for your application. I mean, because your application is generally reviewed, you know, by you know, around three primary reviewers who present your application to the entire study section and think about how, you know, what, you know, how you feel about each person on the, you know, on the study section roster serving in that role. Um, and once you submit, you know, we, we generally advise against switching study sections unless you think that, you know, the feedback that you got, like, you know, um, unless you think they really didn't understand your application. Um, because if you, if you switch study sections, then you're opening yourself up to a whole new set of critiques with a new study section. Next slide. Okay, so, I, I've so some of this I have already addressed, but in deciding where to submit, Again, this, you know, this is where you still have control. It's an active decision. Um, you don't necessarily have to submit to the first IC or PO to accept your application, um, but understand that, you know, it, it's, you know it's, I think the initial shopping period is fine, but after you make a decision, you should be working with, um, you're your in, you know, in a relationship, you know, with your IC and PO and, you know, and should stick to that. Um, so for primary, you, and you can, you can, um, on your application list multiple institutes, one of which should be primary. Um, and, you know, and, and then if there's you know, scientific over overlap with other institutes, they can be secondary ICs. And again, um, just go where you sense the most support. Um, and it's you know, um, in your best interest to thank your PO in writing for accepting your application. Um, because you know, unfortunately, you know, some, um, some applications will get to you know, the funding range for an institute and then the institute will decide that it's not aligned with their priorities. Um, and, you know, and the PI has to figure out, you know, and, and, and we try to potentially find another home or you end up resubmitting. Um, and so if you're, if, um, if you do list secondary ICs, it's sort of like having an insurance policy. Um, but there's, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't cost you anything except for, you know, some time perhaps. Um, but, you know, it's, you know, there's a greater possibility that, you know, that institutes that are listed as a secondary IC can pick up your application if you end up you know, in the situation where um, you need to find another home um, after going through, you know, the entire cycle. 
Um, but, um, you know, and it, it also, I, mean, I think going through this process also helps you build networks and learn about different parts of, you know, NIH. Um, and, you know, when you decide, you know, and when you decide where to go, you know, close loops, let us know, you know, if you decide to go somewhere else, but, you know, but maintain open doors. Next slide. So after peer, so I guess after peer review, um, um, you know, your, your application will be, will be scored um, and you'll receive um, a summary statement that will generally include, um, you know, the comments from your primary reviewers on the um, different um, components of an AH review. Um, and if your application was discussed, which is generally the top half of applications that were submitted to a study section, then um, you'll see a resume of discussion, you know, a, a, a summary paragraph about, about the group discussion. Um, we need to wait until you receive this before we can talk to you about your review. Um, and, and, and if your PO was able to listen to your review, we might have additional, you know, we might be able to help put things in context or provide additional, um, additional comment <clears throat> and, and guidance regarding um, next steps. Excuse me. <coughs> Um, and again, um, at NIH, you know, your um, after, after after study section, your application will go through multiple other levels of review. Um, you know, your PO, um, you know, council and, and the institute director before um, you uh, receive a notice of award. Next slide. Okay, so, so I guess I've mentioned um, being with Penny Line doesn't necessarily mean you're getting funded yet. And I, I discussed reconnecting after you had a chance to review and digest the summary statement. Um, next slide, I discussed that, sorry. Okay, um, and so if, you're, um, so if your application is potentially within funding range, and you can get a sense of this from um, looking online at the historical pay lines for the Institute. Um, many PIs, including myself, will ask um, for your response to review or identified weaknesses in the summary statement. And so here, if I don't already, if I don't already know, if you haven't already contacted me, I'll generally reach out to you here, um, you know, because we want to, be, you know, we want, um, you know, to ensure that, you know, that we're comfortable accepting your response to the summary statement. Um, and then again, your um, application will go on to council institute level review. I generally advise that no news is good news at this stage because we're generally, you know, not contact you unless somebody identifies a problem or a question, and you know, and to just hang in here. And so, if you're, you know, so if you're really potentially within funding range, this is where I say that you're, you know, you can, you know, your, your champagne is on ice, but don't open it yet. Next slide. Um, for applications that might be funded, um, grants management again will send a just-in-time request, you know, to, you know, to clarify, you know, just to. Um, you know, clarify administrative questions um, and to clarify administrative questions. Um, and, 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 um, and your PO will, um, will, if you're doing a clinical trial request, PO, uh, clinical trial milestones, um, to, to which you'll be held accountable throughout the, throughout your funding cycle. And here I would suggest just being kind to yourself so that you don't overpromise. And end up, you know, in a position where then we have to start um, taking administrative steps. Um, and for clinical trials, your PO or IC will, you know, will, will do a, a, you know, a risk assessment, which is new, that will determine um, your reporting frequency throughout the funding, throughout your funding cycle. And I'm just realizing that I'm running long, so I'm going to try to speed up. Next slide. Um, so again. Um, Grants manage so your official notice of award comes from grants management, not your PO, and you need to read and comply with the um, the provisions in the award. And again, administrative bu budget reductions, you know, um, are less painful if you, uh, um, if you've already anticipated them. And then um, and now the champagne is open. Next slide. Um, so post award, your PO, your PO can also work with you um, again. In a, in a relational way about, you know, serving to some extent as your advocate. And so we, ad, we can advocate for PIs, you know, single PIs or, and or areas of science um, for, 
and things that, where it's nice to let us know. I mean, if you're going to be potentially attending the same meetings, you, know, you can ask to meet your PO for coffee. Um, let us know in advance about your presentation and see if we can go. Um, we, ca we can and do invite um, PIs to speak at NIH, and this you know, helps increase exposure for you and your area of science. Um, and it's also helpful to, for us to know about, you know, about your success, about your success. You know, when you're getting, um, you know, when you're getting press coverage, um, that, you know, having that external validation helps us advocate for you and your area of science. Um, and, as, and um, when you have major publications that there's with revisions, let us know so that we can see if our press office would like to do anything. Um, and also, you know, I, I do try to um, engage PIs um, on public input opportunities when I'm trying to advocate for areas of science. And when, I, when, we're, when we're trying to advocate for your area of science, please engage um, and try to speak beyond your own specific work or, or area of science, just so that you have maintain a broad, broader perspective. Next slide. Um, again, ways to help us are by using um, publicly available information in your institution. At NIH, um, you know, for administrative matters, you can contact the, um, the help desk. Um, it's, you know, and, and little things help us, like reminding us, you know, if you, if you have a grants question, remind us, you know, in your email who your grants management specialist is, we don't have to look it up. Um, and, you know, and send, yeah, I, and I, I think I'm referring to sending, attach, sending attachments of, of documents that you want us to review is also helpful as well. Next slide. Okay, so, so in closing, um, you know, your, your program officer is, you know, our, our role is scientific stewardship of, of federal funding. Um, but we also can stimulate research and promote opportunities, and we can open do we can open doors for you um, through bringing you into other um, you know to other activities related to your areas of science. And we want our PIs to be maximally successful, and a re positive relationship can be mutually rewarding. Next slide. That's it, and that's a real fortune cookie. Thank you. Thanks so much for sharing, Dr. Lee. That was really really helpful overview and specifics. Um, so now we have a few minutes to take some questions. So if you would, please use the Zoom function to raise your hand and we can get some questions going either for Dr. Lee or Dr. Siegel. Um, Eleanor, you can go ahead. You can unmute yourself and ask. Hi, um, I'm Eleanor Rivera. I'm assistant professor over the University of Illinois Chicago College of Nursing. Um, I was just wondering, and this question may be more for Dr. Siegel, just is, are any of these steps any different at all when you're talking about a K award versus a traditional award? Um, well, we don't offer K awards, so. Oh, I thought there was a K-08, I'm sorry. No, sorry. Um, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, AHRQ and, uh, and NIH, I think, would, would offer those, but Pocori doesn't specifically offer K awards. Okay, thank you. Follow-up question, Dr. Siegel, does um, PCORI offer any sort of training awards for postdocs or PhD students? No, uh, not that I am aware of. However, I, you know, PCORI is a, a small organization um, and we are, are pretty flexible. We do have a variety of internships that we run uh, and fellows that we have, they're, they're not postdoc. They're, you know, we have, we have some at the master's level, for example. If there's something particular that you're interested in, um, you know, send us a note. Any other questions? Any questions from the chat? Nothing from the chat, but I have another question if there aren't any other questions from the audience. Um, and I'm hoping both of you all can speak to this. So towards the end of your presentation, Dr. Siegel, you mentioned being a merit reviewer. And I'm wondering for both of you, for NIH and PCORI, and maybe even AHRQ, if you can speak to it, what are the requirements for being a reviewer? So can someone like me who's a PhD candidate serve as a grant reviewer or do you have to have the terminal degree? That's a really good question and I'm afraid that I do not have the answer to that question. Um, I would have to consult with our, our, um, our merit review team. Um, but if you're interested, I, you know, again, I would um, 
you know, suggest that you shoot us a, an email, which we can route appropriately. We also have the info at pcori.org um, address that you can ask for general information. And, um, you know, I think it's, it's worth checking out whether it's for immediately or for the future. Um, because it, you know, it's clearly a part of uh, professional service, but it, it really does give you a range of insights. And at least from my experience, um, you know, there's a balance of people who are included in, in merit review pa panels. They include people who are very, uh, you know, have long experience in the field, but they include others who have the newest experience in the field. And, um, you know, as you know, are, you know, kind of taking a, putting a lot of effort, I think, into their reviews, and there's definitely a role for that. Um, PCORI's merit reviews have a, uh, a variety of participants. We have not only science reviewers, um, but we also have stakeholder reviewers and patient representatives. Um, so there are a variety of um, different perspectives that we're looking for in merit review. And depending on the particular panel, uh, you'll find you know a particular emphasis on on a different um, on on different people and different participation. So if you're at all interested, you know, please, please do check it out. You'll, you'll be surprised at how much insight you get um, into the way this works. I've, I've had a number of researchers on our DNI panels and they <laughs> come out with it with a like, oh, I see why that was important. Everybody asked about that. All the other reviewers wanted to know more about this. Um, so it's, it's quite uh, illuminating. Um. Same question, Dr. Lee. Yeah, I, I guess the short answer is that um, at, you know, I, I, yeah, the short answer is for NIH, you know, the study sections are, you know, generally required. I, I should check what the, what the most up-to-date requirements are, but, you know, they have required, um, you know, that, you know, the, that um, reviewers have an IRR1, essentially, if they're already an independent investigator. So, so NIH reviewers tend to be more, you know, further along. But you know, you should definitely you know, partake. And when we have like mock studies at, at you know at, at workshops or you know at conferences, you know, we try to um, you know for career development, you know, have mock study section perhaps um, to give you know to give trainees and and um, and junior investigators a sense of what the process is like. I mean, I, I, that's you know um, something that might help you um, you know learn more about the process. Thank you. Um, we do have a, can another I, question from sorry, you. Sorry, Brian, I, I just wanted to follow up on my answer since I just oh, yeah, go ahead, sorry. And my staff. Um, uh, and he is telling me that you can be a postdoc, um, but you must have publications. I believe that the number is three. So, okay. Sorry. <laughs> In real time. Yes. <laughs> wow, great. Um, and we do have another question uh, from yeah, if you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, yes, thank you. Uh, my question is from both uh, um, uh, both speakers. Actually, um, I wonder if uh, PCORI or uh, NIH, they, um, the, the applications from industry would be considered or not. If yes, uh, what would be the specific um, criteria? Is it the same as for academia? I don't think so. Maybe uh, I'm wrong. Uh, but if there is any uh, any uh, specific um, uh, criteria for those applicants, I would highly appreciate if you clarify. Thank you. So, Jan, does PCORI consider the consulting applicants, and what are the criteria for that? So, um, so I'm just, uh, you know, looking back some, of, I, I, there will, of course, be more specific information and um, on our website, and I, you know, my, my preference is really to, to make sure you, you have the full set of correct information on that. But just in terms of, you know, in, in general, it's the, the cases that it is, uh, a consulting organization is not excluded from applying. Um, but I'm afraid I cannot speak to the specific um, requirements, particularly for the um, for this the research side um, of the organization. So I, 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 I sorry, I can't give you any more, but um, 
if you are interested in following up with the research side, um, uh, there's a, an email that you can, can uh, write directly to, which is sciencequestions at kokori.org. And we're pretty good about responding directly to our, our emails. Thank you. Uh, and I believe, Tara, you had a quick question. Yeah, I had a quick question um, just for Joanna. Um, when is the right time to reach out to a program officer at PCORI? Is it before the letter of intent or once the letter of intent has been accepted or what do you recommend? Well, for our program, we, we very much, for that is for the dissemination and implementation program, we very strongly encourage um, applicants to reach out to us before the application to talk about implementation and what we're looking for. And particularly because many researchers don't have as much experience doing implementation work. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, uh, they, we can give very clear feedback um, on a concept. Usually that's what we'll do. We'll ask for a one page concept when you uh, send in a request, um, review that concept with you on a, on a phone call and, and kind of course correct. Um, we're also able to talk about other funding opportunities in the area. Um, for the, um, on the science side, again, it's gonna depend a lot on which PFA you're applying for um, and, and specifically how that program likes to handle it. And if, but um, I think the best way to approach it is you should of course have a concept in mind. <laughs> there's, there's some place that you wanna go that's consistent with the PFA um, and particularly if you have specific questions, but beyond that, just to ask if you can get some preliminary feedback on your concept, then you're much more likely to submit a letter of intent that's on, on track and, um, and, have, and be invited to submit a full application. Great, that's really helpful. Yeah, it's just another, um, it's just another opportunity to get uh, to hone what you're proposing so that it's consistent with a funding organization. And I think Karen really, act, really um, you know, emphasized that as, as well. Um, you know, it, it might look from the outside like a black box, uh, but you know, from the inside, we want strong applications. It's, just, it's very little use for us to get an application, for, for example, um, you know, that, that is on something that we just won't fund or you know, that's, that um, has incorrectly interpreted an eligibility criterion or something like that. It's much better for us um, to get you on track and putting your best foot forward so that we can um, have a better chance of funding it. Makes sense. All right, thank you. Thanks. Uh, well, thanks everyone for showing up. I think that's all the time we have, uh, but exactly. thank you to everyone here and thank you to Dr. Lee and Dr. Siegel. Channing, did you wanna say something? I just said big thanks to our presenters. That was wonderful. Thanks for putting it together. Hope yeah. to hear from some of you. Great. Thanks again. Take, Take care, care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.